St. Anthony's War Against Demons Excerpts from the Life of St. Anthony by St. Athanasius of Alexandria, Bishop, Father, and Doctor of the Church St. Anthony, you must know, was by descent an Egyptian. His parents were of good family and possessed considerable wealth, and, as they were Christians, he also was reared in the same faith. In infancy, he was brought up with his parents, knowing naught else but them and his home. But when he was grown and arrived at boyhood and was advancing in years, he could not endure to learn letters, nor caring to associate with other boys, but all his desire was, as it was written of Jacob, to live a plain man at home. After the death of his father and mother, he was left alone with one little sister. His age was about eighteen or twenty, and on him the care both of home and sister rested. Now it was not six months after the death of his parents, and going according to the custom into the Lord's house, he communed with himself and reflected as he walked how the apostles left all and followed the Savior, and how they in the acts sold their possessions and brought and laid them at the apostles' feet for distribution to the needy, and what and how great a hope was laid up for them in heaven. Pondering over these things he entered the church, and it happened the gospel was being read, and he heard the Lord saying to the rich man, If thou wouldest be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and come follow me, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Anthony, as though God had put him in the mind of the saints, and the passage had been read on his account, went out immediately from the church, and gave the possessions of his forefathers to the villagers. They were three hundred acres, productive and very fair, that they should be no more a clog upon himself and his sister. And all the rest that was movable he sold, and having gotten together much money he gave it to the poor, reserving a little, however, for his sister's sake. And again, as he went into the church, hearing the Lord say in the gospel, Be not anxious for the morrow, he could stay no longer, but went out and gave those things also to the poor. Having committed his sister to known and faithful virgins, and put her into a convent to be brought up, he henceforth devoted himself outside his house to discipline, taking heed to himself and training himself with patience. For there were not yet so many monasteries in Egypt, and no monk at all knew of the distant desert, but all who wished to give heed to themselves practiced the discipline in solitude near their own village. Now there was then in the next village an old man who had lived the life of a hermit from his youth up. Anthony, after he had seen this man, imitated him in piety, and at first he began to abide in places outside the village. Then if he heard of a good man anywhere, like the prudent bee, he went forth and sought him, nor turned back to his own palace until he had seen him, and he returned, having got from the good man, as it were, supplies for his journey in the way of virtue. So dwelling there at first, he confirmed his purpose not to return to the abode of his fathers, nor to the remembrance of his kinsfolk, but to keep all his desire and energy for perfecting his discipline. He worked, however, with his hands, having heard, He who is idle, let him not eat and part he spent on bread, and part he gave to the needy. And he was constant in prayer, knowing that a man ought to pray in secret unceasingly. For he had given such heed to what was read, that none of the things that were written fell from him to the ground, but he remembered all, and afterwards his memory served him for books. Thus conducting himself, Anthony was beloved by all, he subjected himself in sincerity to the good men whom he visited, and learned thoroughly where each surpassed him in zeal and discipline. But the devil, who hates and envies what is good, could not endure to see such a resolution in a youth, but endeavored to carry out against him what he had wont to effect against others. First of all he tried to lead him away from the discipline, whispering to him the remembrance of his wealth, care for his sister, claims of kindred, love of money, love of glory, the various pleasures of the table and the other relaxations of life. And at last, the difficulty of virtue and the labor of it, he suggested also the infirmity of the body and the length of the time. In a word, he raised in his mind a great dust of debate, 
wishing to debar him from his settled purpose. But when the enemy saw himself to be too weak for Anthony's determination, and that he rather was conquered by the other's firmness, overthrown by his great faith and falling through his constant prayers, then at length, putting his trust in the weapons which are in the navel of his belly, and boasting in them, for they are his first snare for the young, he attacked the young man, disturbing him by night and harassing him by day, so that even the onlookers saw the struggle which was going on between them. The one would suggest foul thoughts, and the other counter them with prayers. The one fire him with lust, the other, as one who seemed to blush, fortify his body with faith, prayers, and fasting. And the devil, unhappy wit, one night even took upon him the shape of a woman and imitated all her acts simply to beguile Anthony. But he, his mind filled with Christ and the nobility inspired by him, and considered the spirituality of the soul, quenched the coal of the other's deceit. Again the enemy suggested the ease of pleasure, but he, like a man filled with rage and grief, turned his thoughts to the threatened fire and the gnawing worm, and setting these in array against his adversary, passed through the temptations unscathed. All this was a source of shame to his foe, for he, deeming himself like God, was now mocked by a young man, and he who boasted himself against flesh and blood was being put to flight by a man in the flesh. For the Lord was working with Anthony, the Lord, for our sake, took flesh, and gave the body victory over the devil, so that all who truly fight can say, Not I, but the grace of God which was with me. At last, when the dragon could not even thus overthrow Anthony, but saw himself thrust out of his heart, gnashing his teeth as it is written, as it were beside himself, he appeared to Anthony like a black boy, taking a visible shape, in accordance with the color of his mind, and cringing to him as it were, he plied him with thoughts no longer, for guileful as he was, he had been worsed, but at least spoke in human voice and said, Many I deceived, many I cast down, but now attacking thee in thy labors as I had many others, I proved weak. When Anthony asked, Who art thou who speakest thus with me? He answered with a lamentable voice, I am the friend of whoredom, and have taken upon me incitements which lead to it against the young. I am called the spirit of lust. How many had I, have I deceived who wish to live soberly? How many are the chaste whom by my incitements I have over-persuaded? I am he on account of whom also the prophet reproves those who have fallen, saying, Ye have been caused to err by the spirit of whoredom for by me they have been tripped up. I am he who have so often troubled thee, and have so often been overthrown by thee. But Anthony, having given thanks to the Lord with courage, said to him, Thou art very despicable then, for thou art black-hearted and weak as a child. Henceforth I shall have no trouble from thee, for the Lord is my helper, and I shall look down on mine enemies. Having heard this, the black one straightway fled, shuddering at the words and dreading any longer even to come near the man. This was Anthony's first struggle against the devil, or rather, this victory was the Savior's work in Anthony, who condemned sin in the flesh that the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. But neither did Anthony, although the evil one had fallen, henceforth relax his care and despise him nor did the enemy, as though conquered, cease to lay snares for him. For again he went around as a lion seeking some occasion against him. But Anthony, having learned from the scriptures that the devices of the devil are many, zealously continued the discipline, reckoning that though the devil had not been able to deceive his heart by bodily pleasure, he would endeavor to ensnare him by other means. For the demon loves sin. Wherefore, more and more he repressed the body and kept it in subjection, lest, happily having conquered on one side, he should be dragged down on the other. He therefore planned to accustom himself to a severer mode of life, and many marveled, but he himself used to bear the labor easily, for the eagerness of soul, through the length of time it had abode in him, had wrought a good habit in him, so that taking but little initiation from others, he showed great zeal in this matter. He kept vigil to such an extent that he often continued the whole night without sleep, and this was not once but often, to the marvel of others. 
He ate once a day after sunset, sometimes once in two days, and often even in four. His food was bread and salt, his drink water only. Of flesh and wine it is superfluous to even to speak, since no such thing was found with the other earnest men. A rush mat served him to sleep upon, but for the most part he lay upon the bare ground. He would not anoint himself with oil, saying it behooved young men to be earnest in training and not to seek what would venerate the body. But they must accustom it to labor, mindful of the apostle's words, When I am weak, then I am strong. For said he, the fiber of the soul is the sound when the pleasures of the body are diminished. And he had come to this truly wonderful conclusion, that progress in virtue and retirement from the world for the sake of it ought not to be measured by time, but by desire and fixity of purpose. He at last gave no thought to the past, but day by day, as if he were at the beginning of his discipline, applied greater pains for advancement. Thus tightening his hold upon himself, Anthony departed to the tombs, which happened to be a distance from the village, and having bid one of his acquaintances to bring him bread at intervals of many days, he entered one of the tombs, and the other, having shut the door on him, he remained within alone. And when the enemy could not endure it, but was even fearful that in a short time Anthony would fill the desert with the discipline, coming one night with a multitude of demons, he so cut him with stripes that he lay on the ground speechless from the excessive pain. For he affirmed that the torture had been so excessive that no blows inflicted by man could have ever caused him such torment. But by the providence of God, for the Lord never overlooks them that hope in him. The next day his acquaintance came bringing him the loaves, and having opened the door and seeing him lying on the ground as though dead, he lifted him up and carried him to the church in the village and laid him upon the ground. And many of his kinsfolk and the villagers sat around Anthony as round a corpse. But about midnight he came to himself and he rose, and when he saw them all asleep, and his comrade alone watching, he motioned with his head for him to approach, and asking him to carry him again to the tombs without waking anybody. He was carried therefore by the man, and as he wont, when the door was shut he was within alone, and he could not stand up on account of the blows, but he prayed as he lay. And after he had prayed, he said with a shout, Here am I, Anthony, I flee not from your stripes, for even if you inflict more, nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ. And then he sang, Though a camp be set against me, my heart shall not be afraid. These were the thoughts and words of this aesthetic. But the enemy, who hates good, marveling that after the blows he dared to return, called together his hounds and burst forth. Ye see, said he, that neither by the spirit of lust nor by blows did we stay the man, but he braves us. Let us attack him in another fashion. But changes of form for the evil are easy for the devil. So in the night they made such a din that the whole of that place seemed to be shaken by an earthquake, and the demons, as if breaking the four walls of the dwelling, seemed to enter through them, coming in the likeness of beasts and creeping things. And the place was on a sudden filled with the forms of lions, bears, leopards, bulls, serpents, asps, scorpions, and wolves, and each of them was moving according to his nature. The lion was roaring, wishing to attack, the bull seeming to toss with its horns, the serpent writhing but unable to approach, and the wolf as it rushed on was restrained, altogether the noise of the apparition with their angry ragings were dreadful. But Anthony, stricken and goaded by them, felt bodily pain severe still. He lay watching, however, with unshaken soul, groaning from bodily anguish, but his mind was clear, and, as in mockery, he said, If there had been any power in you, it would have sufficed had one of you come. But since the Lord hath made you weak, you attempt to terrify me by numbers, and a proof of your weakness is that you take the shapes of brute beasts. And again with boldness he said, If you are able, and have received power against me, delay not to attack. But if you are unable, why trouble me in vain? For faith in our Lord is a seal and a wall of safety to us. So after many attempts they gnashed their teeth upon him, because they were mocking themselves rather than him. Nor was the Lord then forgetful of Anthony's wrestling, but was at hand to help him. So looking up he saw the roof as it were opened, 
and a ray of light descending to him. The demon suddenly vanished, the pain of his body straightway ceased, and the building was again whole. But Anthony, feeling the help, and getting his breath again, and being freed from pain, besought the vision which had appeared to him, saying, Where wert thou? Why didst thou not appear at the beginning to make my pains to cease? And a voice came to him, Anthony, I was here, but I waited to see thy fight. Wherefore, since thou hast endured, and hast not been worsened, I will ever be a succor to thee, and will make thy name known everywhere. Having heard this, Anthony arose and prayed, and received such strength that he persevered that he had more power in his body than formerly, and he was then about thirty-five years old. But those of his acquaintances who came, since he did not permit them to enter, often used to spend days and nights outside, and heard as it were crowds within clamoring, dining, sending forth piteous voices and crying, Go from what is ours! What dost thou even in the desert? Thou canst not abide our attack! So at first those outside thought there were some men fighting with him, and that they had entered by ladders, but when stooping down they saw through a hole there was nobody. They were afraid, accounting them to be demons, and they called to Anthony. Then he quickly heard, though he had not given a thought to the demons, and coming to the door he besought them to depart and not to be afraid. For thus, said he, the demons make their seeming onslaughts against those who are cowardly. Sign yourselves therefore with the cross, and depart boldly, and let these make sport for themselves. So they departed fortified with the sign of the cross. But he remained in no wise harmed by the evil spirits, nor was he wearied with the contest, for there came to his aid visions from above, and the weakness of the foe relieved him of much trouble and armed him with greater zeal. For his acquaintances used often to come expecting to find him dead, and would hear him singing, Let God arise, and let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before his face. As smoke vanisheth this, let them vanish. As wax melteth before the face of fire, so let the sinners perish from the face of God. And again, all nations compass me about, and in the name of the Lord I requited them. And so for nearly twenty years he continued training himself in solitude, never going forth, and but seldom seen by any. After this, when many were eager and wishful to imitate his discipline, and his acquaintances came and began to cast down and wrench off the door by force, Anthony, as from a shrine, came forth, initiated in the mysteries and filled with the Spirit of God. Then, for the first time he was seen outside, the fort by those who came to see him. And they, when they saw him, wondered at the sight, for he had the same habit of body as before, and was neither fat, like a man without exercise, nor lean from fasting and striving with the demons. But he was just the same as they had known him before his retirement. And again his soul was free from blemish, for it was neither contracted as by grief, nor relaxed by pleasure, nor possessed by laughter or dejection. For he was not troubled when he beheld the crowd, nor overjoyed at being saluted by so many. But he was altogether even as being guided by reason and abiding in a natural state. Through him the Lord healed the bodily ailments of many presents, and cleansed other from evil spirits. And he gave grace to Anthony in speaking, so that he consoled many that were sorrowful, and set those at variance at one, exhorting all to prefer the love of Christ before all that is in the world. And while he exhorted and advised them to remember the good things to come, and the loving kindness of God's towards us, who spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, he persuaded many to embrace the solitary life, and thus it happened, in the end, that cells arose even in the mountains, and the desert was colonized by monks, who came forth from their own people, and enrolled themselves for the citizenship in the heavens. One day, when he had gone forth because all the monks had assembled to him, and asked to hear words from him, he spoke to them in the Egyptian tongue as follows, The scriptures are enough for instruction but it is a good thing to encourage one another in the faith, and to stir up with words. Wherefore you, as children, carry that which you know to your father, and I, as the elder, share my knowledge and what experience has taught me with you. 
Let this especially be the common aim of all, neither to give way having once begun, nor to faint in trouble, nor to say, We have lived in the discipline a long time, but rather, as though making a beginning daily, let us increase our earnestness. For the whole life of man is very short, measured by the ages to come, wherefore all our time is nothing compared with eternal life. And in the world everything is sold at its price, and a man exchanges one equivalent for another. But the promise of eternal life is bought for a trifle. For it is written, The days of our life in them are threescore years and ten. But if they are in strength, fourscore years, and what is more than these is labor and sorrow. Whenever, therefore, we live full fourscore years, or even a hundred in the discipline, not for a hundred years only shall we reign, but instead of a hundred we shall reign for ever and ever. And though we fought on earth, we shall not receive our inheritance on earth. But we have the promises in heaven, and having put off the body which is corrupt, we shall receive it incorrupt. Wherefore, children, let us not faint nor deem that the time is too long, or that we are doing something great. For the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. Nor let us think, as we look at the world, that we have renounced anything of much consequence, for the whole earth is very small compared with all the heaven. Wherefore, if it even chanced that we were lords of all the earth and gave it all up, it would be not worthy of a comparison with the kingdom of heaven. For as if a man should despise a copper drachma to gain a hundred drachmas of gold, so if a man were lord of all the earth and were to renounce it, that which he gives up is little, and he receives a hundredfold. But if not even the whole earth is equal in value to the heavens, then he who has given up a few acres leaves as it were nothing. And even if he has given up a house or much gold, he, had, he ought not to boast nor be low-spirited. Further, we should consider that even if we do relinquish them for virtue's sake, still afterwards, when we die, we shall leave them behind. Very often, as the preacher saith, to those to whom we do not wish, why then should we not give them up for virtue's sake, that we may inherit even a kingdom? Therefore, let the desire of possession take hold of no one. For what is gain is to acquire these things which we cannot take with us? Why not rather get those things which we can take with us, to wit, prudence, justice, temperance, courage, understanding, love, kindness to the poor, faith in Christ, freedom from wrath, and hospitality? If we possess these, we shall find them of themselves preparing for us a welcome there in the land of the meek-hearted. And so, from such thing let a man persuade himself not to make light of it, especially if he considers that he himself is the servant of the Lord, and ought to serve his master. Wherefore, as a servant would not dare to say, Because I worked yesterday, I will not work today, and considering the past will do no work in the future, but as it is written in the gospel, daily shows the same readiness to please his master, and to avoid risk. So let us daily abide firm in our discipline, knowing that if we are careless for a single day, the Lord will not pardon us for the sake of the past, but will be wrath against us for our neglect. As we have also heard in Ezekiel, and as Judas because of one night destroyed his previous labor. Wherefore, children, let us hold fast our discipline, and let us not be careless. For in it the Lord is our fellow worker, as it is written, To all that choose the good, God worketh with them for good. But to avoid being heedless, it is good to consider the word of the Apostle, I die daily. For if we too live as though dying daily, we shall not sin. And the meaning of that saying is, that as we rise day by day, we should think that we shall not abide till evening, and again, when about to lie down to sleep, we should think that we shall not rise up. For our life is naturally uncertain, and providence allots it to us daily. But thus ordering our daily life, we shall never fall into sin, nor have a lust for anything, nor cherish wrath against any, nor shall we heap up treasure upon earth. But, as though under the daily expectation of death, we shall be without wealth, and shall forgive all things to all men, nor shall we retain at all the desire of women or of any other foul pleasure. But we shall turn from it as past and gone, ever striving and looking forward to the day of judgment. For the greater dread and danger of torment ever destroys the ease of pleasure, 
and sets up the soul if it is like to fall. Wherefore, having already begun and set out in the way of virtue, let us strive the more that we may attain those things that are before, and let no one turn to the things behind, like Lot's wife, all the more so that the Lord hath said, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and turning back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. And, this turning back is not else but to feel regret, and to be once more worldly minded. But fear not to hear a virtue, nor be astonished at the name, for it is not far from us, nor is it without ourselves, but it is within us, and is easy if we are only willing. That they may get knowledge, the Greeks live abroad and cross the sea, but we have no need to depart from home for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, nor to cross the sea for the sake of virtue. For the Lord aforetime hath said, The kingdom of heaven is within you. Wherefore, virtue hath need at our hands of willingness alone, since it is in us, and is formed from us. For when the soul hath its spiritual faculty in a natural state, virtue is formed, and it is a natural state when it remains as it came into existence, and when it came into its existence it was fair and exceeding honest. For this cause Joshua, the son of Nun, and his exhortation said to the people, Make straight your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And John, Make your path straight. For rectitude of soul consists in having its spiritual part in its natural state as created. But on the other hand, when it swerves and turns away from its natural state, that is called vice of the soul. Thus the matter is not difficult. If we abide as we have been made, we are in a state of virtue. But if we think of ignoble things, we shall be accounted evil. If, therefore, this thing had to be acquired from without, it would be difficult in reality. But if it is in us, let us keep ourselves from foul thoughts. And as we have received the soul as a deposit, let us preserve it for the Lord, that he may recognize his work as being the same as he made it. And let us strive that wrath rule us not, nor lust overcome us, for it is written, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, and lust, when it hath received, beareth sin, and the sin, when it is full grown, bringeth forth death. Thus living, let us keep guard carefully, and as it is written, keep our hearts with all watchfulness. For we have terrible and crafty foes, the evil spirits, and against them we wrestle, as the apostle said. For not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Great is their number in the air around us, and they are not far from us. Now there are a great distinction among them, and concerning their nature and distinctions much could be said, but such a description is for others of greater powers than we possess. But at this time it is pressing and necessary for us only to know their wiles against ourselves. First, therefore, we must know this, that the demons have not been created like what we mean when we call them by that name. For God made nothing evil, but even they have been made good. Having fallen, however, from the heavenly wisdom, since then they have been groveling on earth. On the one hand, they deceive the Greeks with their displays, while out of envy of us Christians, they move all things in their desire to hinder us from entry into the heavens, in order that we should not ascend up thither from whence they fell. Thus there is need of much prayer and of discipline, that when a man has received through the Spirit the gift of discerning spirits, he may have power to recognize their characteristics, which of them are less and which more evil, of what nature is the special pursuit of each, and how each of them is overthrown and cast out for their villainies and their changes in the plots are many. The blessed apostle and his followers knew such things when they said, For we are not ignorant of his devices, and we, from the temptations we have suffered at their hands, ought to correct one another under them. Wherefore, I, having had proof of them, speak as to children. The demons, therefore, if they see all Christians, and monks especially, laboring cheerfully and advancing, first make an attack by temptation, and place hindrances to hamper our way, to wit, evil thoughts. But we need not fear their suggestions, for by prayer, 
fasting and faith in the Lord, their attack immediately fails. But even when it does, they cease not, but knavishly by subtly come on again. For when they cannot deceive the heart openly with foul pleasures, they approach in different guise, and thenceforth, shaping displays, they attempt to strike fear, changing their shapes, taking the forms of women, wild beasts, creeping things, gigantic bodies, and troops of soldiers. But not even then need ye fear their deceitful displays, for they are nothing and quickly disappear, especially if a man fortify himself beforehand with faith and the sign of the cross. Yet are they bold and very shameless, for if thus they are worsted, they make an onslaught in another matter, and pretend to prophesy and foretell the future, and to show themselves of a height reaching to the roof and of great breadth, that they may stealthily catch by such displays those who could not be deceived by their arguments. If here also they find the soul strengthened by faith and a hopeful mind, then they bring their leader to their aid. And he said they often appeared as the Lord revealed the devil to Job, saying, His eyes as the morning star. From his mouth proceeded burning lamps and hearths of fire are cast forth. The smoke of a furnace blazing with the fire of coals proceeds from his nostrils. His breath is coals, and from his mouth issues flame. When the prince of the demons appears in this ways, the crafty one, as I said before, strikes terror by striking great things, as again the Lord convicted him, saying to Job, For he counteth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. Yea, he counteth the sea as a pot of ointment, and the depths of the abyss as a captive, and the abyss as a covered walk. And by the prophet, the enemy said, I will pursue and overtake. And again by another, I will grasp the whole world in my hand as a nest, and take it up as eggs that have been left. Such, in a word, are their boasts and professions that they may deceive the godly. But not even then ought we, the faithful, to fear his appearance or give heed to his words, for he is a liar, and speaketh of truth never a word. And through speaking words so many and so great in his boldness without doubt, like a dragon he was drawn with a hook by the Saviour and as a beast of burden he received the halter round his nostrils, and as a runaway his nostrils were bound with a ring, and his lips bored with an armlet. And he was bound by the Lord as a sparrow, that we should mock him. And with him are placed the demons as fellows, like serpents and scorpions, to be trodden under foot by us Christians. And the proof of this is that we now live opposed to him. For he who threatened to dry the sea and seize upon the world, behold, now cannot stay our discipline, nor even me speaking against him. Let us then heed not his words, for he is a liar. And let us not fear his visions, seeing that they themselves are deceptive. For that which appears in them is no true light, but they are rather the preludes and likeness of the fire prepared for the demons who attempt to terrify men with those flames in which they themselves will be burned. Doubtless they appear, but in a moment disappear again, hurting none of the faithful, but bringing with them the likeness of that fire which is about to receive themselves. Wherefore, it is unfitting that we should fear them on account of these things, for through the grace of Christ all their practices are in vain. Again, they are treacherous, and are ready to change themselves into all forms and assume all appearances." Very often also, without appearing, they imitate the music of harp and voice, and recall the words of Scripture. Sometimes, too, while we are reading, they immediately repeat many times like an echo what is read. They arouse us from our sleep to prayers, and this constantly, hardly allowing us to sleep at all. At any other time, they assume the appearance of monks and feign the speech of holy men, that by their similarity they may deceive and thus drag their victims where they will. But no heed must be paid to them even if they arouse to prayer, even if they counsel us not to eat at all, even though they seem to accuse and cast shame upon us for those things which once they allowed. For they do this not for the sake of piety or truth, but that they may carry off the simple to despair, that they may say the discipline is useless, and make men loathe the solitary life as a trouble and burden, and hinder those who in spite of them walk in it. Wherefore, the prophet sent by the Lord declared them to be wretched, saying, Woe is he who giveth his neighbors to drink muddy destruction. For such practices and devices are subversive of the way which leads to virtue, 
and the Lord himself, even if the demons spoke the truth, for they said truly, Thou art the Son of God, still bridled their mouths and suffered them not to speak, lest happily they should sow their evil along with the truth, and that he might accustom us never to give heed to them even though they appear to speak what is true. For it is unseemly that we, having the holy scriptures and freedom from the Saviour, should be taught by the devil who hath not kept his own order, but hath gone from one mind to another. Wherefore, even when he uses the language of scripture, he forbids him, saying, But to the sinner said God, Wherefore dost thou declare my ordinances, and takest my covenant in thy mouth? For the demons do all things, they prate, they confuse, they disassemble, they confound, to deceive the simple. They din, laugh madly, and whistle, but if no heed is paid to them forthwith, they weep and lament as though vanquished. The Lord, therefore, as God, stayed the mouth of the demons, and it is fitting that we, taught by the saints, should do like them and imitate their courage. For they, when they saw these things, used to say, when the sinner rose against me, I was dumb and humble, and kept silence from good words. And again, but I was as a deaf man, and heard not, and as a dumb man who opened not his mouth, and I became as a man who heareth not. So let us neither hear them as being strangers to us, nor give heed to them, even though they arouse us to prayer and speak concerning fasting. But let us rather apply ourselves to resolve our discipline, and let us not be deceived by them who do all things in deceit, even though they threaten death, for they are weak, and could do naught but threaten. Already in passing I have spoken on these things, and now I must not shrink from speaking on them at greater length, for to put you in remembrance will be a source of safety. Since the Lord visited earth, the enemy is fallen and his powers weakened. Wherefore? Although he could do nothing, still like a tyrant, he did not bear his fall quietly, but threatened, though his threats were words only. And let each one of you consider this, and he will be able to despise the demons. Now if they were hampered with such bodies as we are, it would be possible for them to say, Men, when they are hidden we cannot find, but whenever we do find them, we do them hurt. And we also, by lying and concealment, could escape them, shutting the doors against them. But if they are not of such nature as this, but are able to enter in, though the doors be shut, and haunt all the air, both they and their leader the devil, and are wishful for evil and ready to injure. And as the Savior said, From the beginning the devil is a manslayer and a father of vice. While we, though this is so, are alive, and spend our lives all the more in opposing him, it is plain they are powerless. For place is no hindrance to their plots, nor do they look on us as friends that they should spare us, nor are they lovers of good that they should make amend, but on the contrary they are evil. And nothing is so much sought after by them as wounding them that love virtue and fear God. But since they have no power to effect anything, they do not but threaten. But if they could, they would not hesitate, but forthwith work evil, for all their desire is set on this and especially against us. Behold, now we are gathered together and speak against them, and they know when we advance they grow weak. If therefore they had power, they would permit none of us Christians to live, for godliness is an abomination to a sinner. But since they can do nothing, they inflict the greater wounds on themselves, for they can fulfill none of their threats. Next this ought to be considered, that we may be in no fear of them, that if they had the power, they would not come in crowds, nor fashion displays, nor with change of form would they frame deceits. But it would suffice that one should come and accomplish that which he was both able and willing to do, especially as every one who has the power neither slays with display, nor strikes fear with tumult, but forthwith makes full use of his authority as he wishes. But the demons, as they have no power, are like actors on the stage, changing their shape and frightening children with tumultuous apparitions in various forms, from which they ought rather to be despised as showing their weakness. At least the true angel the Lord sent against the Assyrian had no need for tumults, nor displays from without, nor noises, nor rattlings, but in quiet he used his power and forthwith destroyed a hundred and eighty-five thousand. 
but demons like these, who have no power, try to terrify at least by their displays. But if any one having in mind the history of Job should say, Why then hath the devil gone forth and accomplished all things against him, and stripped him of all his possessions, and slew his children, and smote him with evil ulcers? Let such a one on the other hand recognize that the devil was not the strong man, but God who delivered Job to him to be tried. Certainly he had no power to do anything, but he asked, and having received it, he hath wrought what he did. So also from this the enemy is more to be condemned, for although willing he could not prevail against one just man. For if he could have, he would not have asked permission. But having asked not once, but also a second time, he shows his weakness and want of power. And it is no wonder if he could do nothing against Job, when destruction would have not come even on his cattle, had not God allowed it. And he has not the power over swine, for, as it is written in the gospel, they besought the Lord, saying, Let us enter the swine. But if they had power not even against swine, much less have they any over men formed in the image of God. So then we ought to fear God only, and despise the demons, and be in no fear of them. But the more they do these things, the more let us intensify our discipline against them. For a good life and faith in God is a great weapon. At any rate, they fear the fasting, the sleeplessness, the prayers, the meekness, the quietness, the contempt of money and vainglory, the humility, the love of the poor, the alms, the freedom from anger of the aesthetics, and chief of all, their piety towards Christ. Wherefore, they do all things that they may not have any that trample on them, knowing the grace given to the faithful against them by the Savior when he says, Behold, I have given to you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and upon all the power of the enemy. Wherefore, if they pretend to foretell the future, let no one give heed. For often they announce beforehand that the brethren are coming days after, and they do come. The demons, however, do this not from any care for the hearers, but to gain their trust, and that then at length, having got them in their power, they may destroy them. Whence we must give no heed to them, but ought rather to confute them when speaking, since we do not need them. For what wonder is it, if, with more subtle bodies than men have, when they have seen them start on their journey, they surpass them in speed and announce their coming? Just as a horseman getting a start of a man on foot announces the arrival of the latter beforehand, so in this there is no need for us to wonder at them. For they know none of those things which are not yet in existence. But God only is he who knoweth all things before their birth. But these, like thieves, running off first when what they see, proclaim it. To how many already have they announced our business, that we are assembled together, and discuss measures against them, before any one of us could go and tell these things. This in good truth a fleet-footed boy could do, getting far ahead of one less slift. But what I mean is this, if any one begins to walk from the Theobad, or from any other district, before he begins to walk, they do not know whether he will walk. But when they see him walking, they run on, and before he comes up, report his approach. And so it falls out that a few days the travelers arrive, but often the walkers turn back, and the demons prove false. So too, with respect to the water of the river, they sometimes make foolish statements. For having seen that there has been much rain in the regions of Ethiopia, and knowing that they are the cause of flood of the river before the water has come to Egypt, they run on and announce it. And this men could have told, if they had a great power of running as the demons, and as David's spy, going up to a lofty place, saw the man approaching better than one who had stayed down below, and the forerunner himself announced, before the others came up. Not those things which had not taken place, but those things which were already on the way and were being accomplished. So these also prefer to labor and declare what is happening to others simply for the sake of deceiving them. If, however, Providence meantime plans anything different for the waters or wayfarers, for Providence can do this, the demons are deceived, and those who gave heed to them cheated. Thus in days gone by arose the oracles of the Greeks, and thus they were led astray by the demons. But thus also thenceforth their deception was brought to an end by the coming of the Lord, who brought to naught the demons and their devices. For they know nothing of themselves, but like thieves, 
what they get to know from others they pass on, and guess at rather than foretell things. Therefore, if sometimes they speak the truth, let no one marvel at them for this. For experienced physicians also, since they conceive the same malady in different people, often foretell what it is, making it out by their acquaintance with it. Pilots, too, farmers from their familiarity with the weather, tell at a glance the state of the atmosphere and forecast whether it will be stormy or fine. And no one would say that they do this by inspiration, but from experience and practice. So if the demons sometimes do the same by guesswork, let no one wonder at it or heed them. For what use to the hearers is it to know from them what is going to happen before the time? Or what concern have we to know such things, even if the knowledge be true? For it is not productive of virtue, nor is it any token of goodness. For none of us is judged for what he knows not, and no one is called blessed because he hath learning and knowledge. But each one will be called to judgment in these points, whether we have kept the faith and truly observed the commandments. Wherefore, there is no need to set much value on these things, nor for the sake of them to practice a life of discipline and labor, but that living well we may please God, and we neither ought to pray to know the future, nor to ask for it as the reward of our discipline. But our prayer should be that the Lord may be our fellow helper for the victory over the devil. And if even once we have a desire to know the future, let us be pure in mind. For I believe that if a soul is perfectly pure and in its natural state, it is able, being clear-sighted, to see more and further than the demons. For it has the Lord who reveals to it, like the soul of Elisha, which saw what was done by Gazi, and beheld the hosts standing on its side. When, therefore, they come by night to you, and wish to tell the future, or say, We are the angels, give no heed, for they lie. Yea, even if they praise your discipline and call you blessed, hear them not, and have no dealings with them. But rather sign yourself and your houses, and pray, and you shall see them vanish. For they are cowards, and greatly fear the sign of the Lord's cross, since of a truth and its Saviour stripped them, and made an example of them. But if they shamelessly stand their ground, capering and changing their forms of appearance, fear them not, nor shrink, nor heed them as though they were good spirits. For the presence either of the good or evil by the help of God can easily be distinguished. The vision of the holy ones is not fraught with distraction. For they will not strive, nor cry, nor shall any one hear their voice. But it comes so quietly and gently that immediately joy, gladness, and courage arise in the soul. For the Lord who is our joy is with them, and the power of God the Father. And the thoughts of the soul remain unruffled and undisturbed, so that it, enlightened as it were with rays, beholds by itself those who appear. For the love of what is divine and of the things to come possesses it and willingly it would be wholly joined with them if it could depart along with them. But, if being men, some fear the vision of the good, those who appear immediately take fear away, as Gabriel did in the case of Zacharias, and as the angel did who appeared to the woman at the holy sepulchre, and as he did who said to the shepherds in the gospel, Fear not, for their fears arose not from timidity, but from the recognition of the presence of superior beings. Such then is the nature of the visions of the holy ones. But the inroad and the display of the evil spirits is fraught with confusion, with din, with sounds and crying such as the disturbance of boorish youths or robbers would occasion, from which arise fear in the heart, tumult and confusion of thought, dejection, hatreds towards them who live a life of discipline, indifference, grief, remembrance of kinsfolk and fear of death, and finally desire of evil things, disregard of virtue and unsettled habits. Whenever, therefore, ye have seen aught and are afraid, if your fear is immediately taken away and in place of it comes joy unspeakable, cheerfulness, courage, renewed strength, calmness of thought and all those I named before, boldness and love towards God, take courage and pray, for joy and a settled state of soul show the holiness of him who is present. Thus Abraham, beholding the Lord, rejoiced. So also John, at the voice of Mary, the God-bearer, leaped for gladness. But if at the appearance of any there is confusion, 
knocking without, worldly display, threats of death and the other things which I have already mentioned, know ye that it is an onslaught of evil spirits. And let this also be a token for you. Whenever the soul remains fearful, there is a presence of the enemies. For the demons do not take away the fear of their presence as the great archangel Gabriel did for Mary or Zacharias, and as he did who appeared to the woman at the tomb, but rather whenever they see men afraid, they increase their delusion that men might be terrified the more, and at last attacking they mock them, saying, Fall down and worship. Thus they deceived the Greeks, and thus by them they were considered gods, falsely so called. But the Lord did not suffer us to be deceived by the devil, for he rebuked him whenever he framed such delusions against him, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. More and more, therefore, let the deceiver be despised by us. For what the Lord hath said, this for our sakes he hath done, that the demons hearing like words from us may be put to flight through the Lord who rebuked them in those words. And it is not fitting to boast at the casting forth of demons, nor to be uplifted by the healing of diseases, nor is it fitting that he who casts out devils should alone be highly esteemed, while he who casts them not out should be considered not. But let a man learn the discipline of each one, and either imitate, rival, or correct it. For the working of signs is not ours, but the Saviour's work. And so he said to his disciples, Rejoice not that the demons are subject to you, but that your names are written in the heavens. For the fact that our names are written in heaven is a proof of our virtuous life, but to cast out demons is a favor of the Saviour, who granted it. Wherefore, to those who boasted in signs but not in virtue, and said, Lord, in thy name did we not cast out demons, and in thy name did many mighty works? He answered, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. For the Lord knoweth not the ways of the wicked. But we ought always to pray, as I said above, that we may receive the gift of discerning spirits, that, as it is written, we may not believe every spirit. I should have liked to speak no further and to say nothing from my own promptings, satisfied with what I have said. But lest you should think that I speak at random and believe that I detail these things without experience or truth, for this cause, even though I should become as a fool, yet the Lord who heareth knoweth the clearness of my conscience, and that it is not for my own sake, but on account of your affection towards me, and at your petition, that I again tell what I saw of the practices of the evil spirits. How often they have called me blessed, and I have cursed them in the name of the Lord! How often have they predicted the rising of the river, and I answered them, What have you to do with it? Once they came threatening and surrounding me like soldiers in full armor. At another time they filled the house with horses, wild beasts and creeping things, and I sang, Summon chariots and summon horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. And at the prayers they were turned to flight by the Lord. Once they came in darkness, being the appearance of a light, and said, We are come to give thee light, Anthony. But I closed my eyes and prayed, and immediately the light of the wicked one was quenched. And a few months after they came as though singing psalms and babbling the words of Scripture. But I, like a deaf man, heard not. Once they shook the cell with an earthquake, but I continued praying with unshaken heart. And after this they came again making noises, whistling and dancing. But as I prayed and lay singing psalms to myself, they forthwith began to lament and weep as if their strength had failed them. But I gave glory to the Lord who had brought down and made an example of their daring and madness. Once a demon, exceedingly high, appeared with pomp and dared to say, I am the power of God and am providence. What dost thou wish that I shall give thee? But I then so much the more breathed upon him and spoke the name of Christ and set about to smite him. And I seemed to have smitten him and forthwith he, big as he was, together with all his demons, disappeared at the name of Christ. At another time, while I was fasting, he came full of craft, under the semblance of a monk, with what seemed to be loathed, and gave counsel, saying, Eat, and cease from thy many labors. Thou also art a man, and art like to fall sick. 
But I, perceiving his device, rose up to pray, and he endured it not. For he departed, and through the door he there seemed to go out as it were smoke. How often in the desert has he displayed what resembled gold, that I should only touch it and look on it. But I sang psalms against him, and he vanished away. Often they would beat me with stripes, and I repeated again and again, Nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ. And at this they rather fell to beating one another. Nor was it that I stayed them and destroyed their power, but it was the Lord who said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. But I, children, mindful of the apostles' words, transferred this to myself, that you might learn not to faint in discipline, nor to fear the devil, nor the delusion of the demons. And since I have become a fool in detailing these things, receive this also as an aid to your safety and fearlessness, and believe me, for I do not lie. Once someone knocked at the door of my cell, and going forth I saw one who seemed a great size and tall. Then when I inquired, Who art thou? He said, I am Satan. Then when I said, Why art thou here? He answered, Why do the monks and all other Christians blame me undeservedly? Why do they curse me hourly? Then I answered, Wherefore dost thou trouble them? He said, I am not he who troubles them, but they trouble themselves, for I am become weak. Have they not read, The swords of the enemy have come to an end, and thou hast destroyed the cities? I have no longer a place, a weapon, a city. The Christians are spread everywhere, and at length even the desert is filled with monks. Let them take heed to themselves, and let them not curse me undeservedly. Then I marveled at the grace of the Lord, and said to him, Thou who art ever a liar, and never speakest the truth, this at length, even against thy will, thou hast truly spoken. For the coming of Christ hath made thee weak, and he hath cast thee down and striped thee. But he, having heard the Saviour's name, and not being able to bear the burning from it, vanished. If, therefore, the devil himself confesses that his power is gone, we ought utterly to despise both him and his demons, and since the enemy with his hounds has but devices of this sort, we, having got to know their weakness, are able to despise them. Wherefore, let us not despond after this fashion, nor let us have a thought of cowardice in our heart, nor frame fears for ourselves, saying, I am afraid lest the demon should come and overthrow me lest he should lift me up and cast me down, or lest rising against me on a sudden he confounded me. Such thoughts let us not have in mind at all, nor let us be sorrowful as though we were perishing, but rather let us be courageous and rejoice always, believing that we are safe. Let us consider in our soul that the Lord is with us. Who put the evil spirits to flight and broke their power? Let us consider and lay to heart that while the Lord is with us, our foes can do us no hurt. For when they come, they approach us in a form corresponding to the state in which they discover us, and adapt their delusions to the condition of mind in which they find us. If, therefore, they find us timid and confused, they forthwith beset the place, like robbers. Having found it unguarded, and what we of ourselves are thinking, they do, and more also. For if they find us faint-hearted and cowardly, they might increase our terror by their delusions and threats, and with these the unhappy soul is thenceforth tormented. But if they see us rejoicing in the Lord, contemplating the bliss of the future, mindful of the Lord, deeming all things in his hand, and that no evil spirit has any strength against the Christian, nor any power at all over any one, when they behold the soul fortified with these thoughts, they are disconfitted and turned backwards. Thus the enemy, seeing Job fenced round with him, withdrew from him. But finding Judas unguarded, him he took captive. Thus, if we are wishful to despise the enemy, let us ponder over the things of the Lord, and let the soul ever rejoice in hope. And we shall see the snares of the demon are like smoke, and the evil ones themselves flee rather than pursue. For they are, as I said before, exceedingly fearful ever looking forward to the fire prepared for them. And for your fearlessness against them, hold this sure sign. Whenever there is any apparition, be not prostrate with fear. But whatsoever it be, first boldly asked, Who art thou? And from whence thou comest thou? And if it should be a vision of holy ones, they will assure you and change your fear into joy. 
But if the vision should be from the devil, immediately it becomes feeble, beholding your firm purpose of mind. For merely to ask, Who art thou, and whence thou comest thou, is a proof of coolness. By thus asking, the son of Nun learned who his helper was, nor did the enemy escape the question of Daniel. While Anthony was thus speaking, all rejoiced. In some the love of virtue increased, and others carelessness was thrown aside. The self-conceit of others was stopped, and all were persuaded to despise the assaults of the evil one, and marveled at the grace given to Anthony from the Lord for the discerning of spirits. So their cells were in the mountains, like filled with holy bands of men who sang psalms, loved reading, fasted, prayed, rejoiced in the hope of things to come, labored in almsgiving, and persevered love and harmony one with another. And truly it was possible, as it were, to behold a land set by itself, filled with piety and justice. For then there was neither the evildoer, nor the injured, nor the reproaches of the tax-gatherer, but instead a multitude of aesthetics, and the one purpose of them all was to aim at virtue, so that any one beholding the cells again and seeing such good order among the monks would lift up his voice and say, How goodly are thy dwellings, O Jacob, and thy tents, O Israel, as shady glens and as a garden, by a river, as tents which the Lord hath pitched, and like cedars near waters. Anthony, however, according to his custom, returned alone to his cell, increased his discipline, and sighed daily as he thought of the mansions in heaven, having his desire fixed on them, and pondering over the shortness of man's life. And he used to eat and sleep, and go about all other bodily necessities with shame when he thought of the spiritual faculties of the soul. So often, when about to eat with any other hermits, recollecting the spiritual food, he begged to be excused, and departed far off from them, deeming it a matter for shame if he should be seen eating by others. He used, however, when by himself, to eat through bodily necessity, but often also with the brethren, covered with shame on these occasions, yet speaking boldly words of help. And he used to say that it behoved a man to give all his time to his soul rather than his body, yet to grant a short space to the body through necessities, but all the more earnestly to give up the whole remainder to the soul and seek its profit, that it might not be dragged down by the pleasures of the body, but on the contrary, the body might be in subjection to the soul. For this is that which was spoken by the Savior, Be not anxious for your life, what ye shall eat, nor for your body what ye shall put on. And do ye seek not what ye shall eat, and what ye shall drink, and be not of a doubtful mind, for all these things the nations of the world seek after. But your Father knoweth that ye had need of all these things. Howbeit, seek ye first his kingdom, and all these things shall be added unto you. And he was altogether wonderful in faith and religious, for he never held communion with the Milesian schismatics, knowing their wickedness and apostasy from the beginning. Nor had he friendly dealings with the Manichaeans or any other heretics, or, if he had, only as far as to advise them that they should change to piety. For he thought and asserted that intercourse with these was harmful and destructive to the soul. In the same manner also he loathed the heresy of the Arians, and exhorted all neither to approach them nor to hold their erroneous belief. And once when certain Arian madmen came to him, when he had questioned them and learned their impiety, he drove them from the mountain, saying that their words were worse than the poison of serpents. And once, also, the Arians having lyingly asserted that Anthony's opinions were the same as theirs, he was displeased and wroth against them. Then being summoned by the bishops and all the brethren, he descended from the mountain, and having entered Alexandria, he denounced the Arians, saying that their heresy was the last of all and a forerunner of the Antichrist. And he taught the people that the Son of God was not a created being, neither had he come into being from non-existence, but that he was the eternal word and wisdom of the essence of the Father. And therefore it was impious to say, there was a time when he was not, for the word was always coexistent with the Father. Wherefore, have no fellowship with the most impious Arians, for there is no communion between light and darkness. 
For you are good Christians, but they, when they say that the Son of the Father, the Word of God, is a created being, differ and not from the heathen, since they worship that which is created, rather than God the Creator. But believe ye that the creation itself is angry with them, because they number the Creator, the Lord of all, by whom all things came into being, with those things which were originated. All the people therefore rejoiced when they had heard the anti-Christian heresy anathemized by such a man. And all the people in the city ran together to see Anthony. And the Greeks, and those who were called their priests, came into the church, saying, We ask to see the man of God. For so they called him. For in that place also the Lord cleansed many of demons, and healed those who were mad. And many Greeks asked that they might even but touch the old man, believing that they should be profited. Assuredly, as many Christians in those few days as one would have seen made in a year. Then when some thought he was troubled by the crowds, and on this account turned them all away from him, he said, undisturbedly, that there were not more of them than of the demons with whom he wrestled in the mountain. But when he was departing, and we were setting him forth on his way, as we arrived at the gate from behind, cried out, Stay thou, man of God, my daughter is grievously vexed by a devil. Stay, I beseech thee, lest I too harm myself with running. And the old man, when he heard her, and was asked by us, willingly stayed. And when the woman drew near, the child was cast on the ground. But when Anthony had prayed and called upon the name of Christ, and the child was raised whole, for the unclean spirit was gone forth, and the mother blessed God, and all gave thanks. And Anthony himself also rejoiced, departing to the mountain, as though it were to his own home. Being known to be so great a man, therefore, and having thus given answers to those who visited him, he returned again to the inner mountain and maintained his wonted discipline. And often when people came to him, and as he was sitting or walking, as it was written in Daniel, he became dumb, and after a season he resumed the thread of what he had been saying before to the brethren who were with him. And his companions perceived that he was seeing a vision. For often, when he was on the mountains, he saw what was happening in Egypt, and told it to Serapion, the bishop, who was indoors with him, and who saw that Anthony was wrapped in a vision. Once, as he was sitting and working, he fell, as it were, into a trance, and groaned much at what he saw. Then after a time, having turned to the bystanders with groans and trembling, he prayed, falling on his knees, remained so a long time, and having arisen, the old man wept. His companions, therefore, trembling and terrified, desired to learn from him what it was, and they troubled him much until he was forced to speak, and with many groans he spake as follows, O oh, my children, it were better to die before what has appeared in the visions come to pass. And when again they asked him, having burst into tears, he said, Wrath is about to seize the church, and it is on the point of being given up to men who are like senseless beasts. For I saw the table of the Lord's house, a mule standing around it on all sides in a ring, and kicking the things therein, just like a herd kicks when it leaps in confusion. And you saw, said he, how I groaned, for I heard a voice saying, My altar shall be defiled. These things the old man saw. And after two years the present inroads of the Arians and the plunder of the churches took place when they violently carried off the vessels, and made the heathen carry them, and when they forced the heathen from the prisons to join in their services, and in their presence did upon the table as they would. Then we all understood that these kicks of the mule signified to Anthony what the Arians, senselessly like beasts, are now doing. But when he saw this vision, he comforted those with him, saying, Be not downcast, my children, for as the Lord has been angry, so again will he heal us. And the church shall soon again receive her own order, and shall shine forth as she is wont. And you shall behold the persecuted restored, and wickedness again withdrawn to its own hiding place, and pious faith speaking boldly in every place with all freedom. Only defile not yourself with the Arians, for their teaching is not that of the apostles, but that of demons, and their father the devil, yea, rather, it is barren and senseless, and without light understanding, like the senselessness of these mules. And Anthony was exceedingly prudent, and the wonder was that, although he had not learned letters, he was a ready-witted man. 
At all events, two Greek philosophers once came, thinking that they could try their skill on Anthony, and he was in the outer mountain, and having recognized who they were from their appearance, he came to them, and said to them by means of an interpreter, Why, philosophers, did ye trouble yourselves so much to come to a foolish man? And when they said that he was not a foolish man, but exceedingly prudent, he said to them, If you came to a foolish man, your labor is superfluous. But if you think me prudent as I am, for we ought to imitate what is good. And if I had come to you, I should have imitated you. But if you come to me, become as I am, for I am a Christian. But they departed with wonder, for they saw that even demons feared Anthony. After this again, certain others came, and these were men who were deemed wise among the Greeks, and they asked him a reason for our faith in Christ. But when they attempted to dispute concerning the preaching of the divine cross and meant to mock Anthony, stopped for a little, and first, pitying their ignorance, said, through an interpreter, who could skillfully interpret his words, which is more beautiful, to confess the cross, or to attribute to those whom you call God's adultery and the seduction of boys? For that which is chosen by us is a sign of courage and a sure token of the contempt of death, while yours are the passions of licentiousness. Next, which is better, to say that the word of God was not changed, but, being the same, he took a human body for the salvation and well-being of man, that having shared in human birth he might make man partake in the divine and spiritual nature? or to liken the divine to senseless animals, and consequently to worship four-footed beasts, creeping things, and the likeness of men. For these things are the objects of reverence of your wise men. But how do you dare to mock us, who say that Christ has appeared as man, seeing that you, bringing the soul from heaven, assert that it has strayed and fallen from the vault of the sky into a body? And would that, you said, that it had fallen into a human body alone, and not asserted that it passes changes into four-footed beasts and creeping things? For our faith declares that the coming of Christ was for the salvation of men. But you err because you speak of soul as not generated. And we, considering the power and loving kindness of providence, think that coming of Christ in the flesh was not impossible with God. But you, although calling the soul the likeness of the mind, connect it with falls and feign in your myths that it is changeable, and consequently introduce the idea that mind itself is changeable by reason of the soul. For whatever is the nature of a likeness, such necessarily is the nature of that which it is a likeness. But whenever you think such a thought concerning mind, remember that you blaspheme even the father of mind himself. But concerning the cross, which would you say to be the better, to bear it, when a plot is brought about by wicked men, nor to be in fear of death, brought about by any form whatever, or to prate about the wanderings of Osiris and Isis, the plot of Typhon, the flight of Kronos, his eating his children and the slaughter of his father. For this is your wisdom. But how, if you mock the cross, do you not marvel at the resurrection? For the same men who told us of the latter wrote the former. Or, why, when you make mention of the cross, are you silent about the dead who were raised, the blind who received their sight, the paralytics who were healed, the lepers who were cleansed, the walking upon the sea, and the rest of the signs and wonders, which show that Christ is no longer a man but God? To me you seem to do yourselves much injustice, and not to have carefully read our scriptures. But read and see that the deeds of Christ prove him to be God, come upon earth for the salvation of men." But do tell us of your religious beliefs. What can you say of these senseless creatures except senselessness and ferocity? But if, as I hear, you wish to say that these things are spoken of by as you as legends, and you allegorize the rape of the maiden Persephone of the earth, the lameness of Hephaetus of fire, and allegorize the air as Hera, the sun as Apollo, the moon as Artemides, and the sea as Poseidon, nonetheless, you do not worship God himself but serve the creature rather than God who created all things. For if because creation is beautiful you compose such legends, still it was fitting that you should stop short at admiration and not make gods of the things created, so that you should not give the honor of the Creator to that which is created. Since, if you do, it is time for you to divert the honor of the master builder to the house built by him, and of the general to the soldier. What then can you reply to these things? that we may know whether the cross hath anything worthy of mockery. But when they were at a loss, turning hither and thither, Anthony smiled and said, again through an interpreter, 
sight itself carries the conviction of these things. But as you prefer to lean upon demonstrative arguments, and as you, having this art, wish us also not to worship God until after such proof, do you tell first how things in general, and specially the recognition of God, are accurately known? Is it through demonstrative argument or the workings of faith? And which is better, faith which comes through the inworking of God, or demonstrations by arguments? And when they answered that faith which comes from the inner workings was better and was accurate knowledge, Anthony said, You have answered well, for faith arises from disposition of soul, but dialectic from the skill of the inventors. Wherefore, to those who have the inworking through faith, demonstrative argument is needless or even superfluous. For what we know through faith this you attempt to prove through words, and often you are not even able to express that which we understand. So the inworking through faith is better and stronger than your professional arguments. We Christians, therefore, hold the mystery not in the wisdom of Greek arguments, but in the power of faith richly supplied to us by God through Jesus Christ. And to show that this statement is true, behold now, without having learned letters, we believe in God, knowing that his works, his providence over all things, and to show that our faith is effective, so now we are supported by faith in Christ, but you, the portents of the idols among you, are being done away, but our faith is extending everywhere. You, by your arguments and quibbles, have converted none from Christianity to paganism. We, teaching the faith on Christ, expose your superstition, since all recognize that Christ is God and the Son of God. You, by your eloquence, do not hinder the teaching of Christ, but we, by the mention of Christ crucified, put all demons to flight, whom you fear as if they were gods. Where the sign of the cross is, magic is weak, and witchcraft has no strength. Tell us, therefore, where are your oracles now? Where are the charms of the Egyptians? Where are the delusions of the magicians? When did all these things cease and grow weak except when the cross of Christ arose? Is it then a fit subject for mockery, and not rather the things brought to naught by it, and convicted of weakness? For this is a marvelous thing, that your religion was never persecuted but even was honored by men in every city, while the followers of Christ are persecuted, and still our side flourishes and multiplies over yours. What is yours, though praise and honor, perishes, while the faith and teaching of Christ, though mocked by you and often persecuted by kings, has filled the world? For when has the knowledge of God so shone forth, or when has self-control and the excellence of virginity appeared as now? Or when has death been so despised except what the cross of Christ has appeared? And this no one doubts when he sees. The martyr despising death for the sake of Christ, when he sees for Christ's sake the virgins of the church keeping themselves pure and undefiled. And these signs are sufficient to prove that the faith of Christ alone is the true religion. But see, you still do not believe in our seeking for arguments. We, however, make our proof not in the persuasive words of Greek wisdom, as our teacher has it, but we persuade by the faith which manifestly precedes argumentative proof. Behold, there are here some vexed with demons. Now there were certain who had come to him very disquieted by demons, and bringing them into the midst he said, Do you cleanse them either by arguments and by whatever art or magic you choose, calling upon your idols? Or, if you are unable, Put away your strife with us, and you shall see the power of the cross of Christ. And having said this, he called upon Christ, and signed the sufferers two or three times with the sign of the cross. And immediately the men stood up whole, and in their right mind, and forthwith gave thanks unto the Lord. And the philosophers, as they are called, wondered, and were astonished exceedingly at the understanding of the man, and at the sign which had been wrought. But Anthony said, Why marvel ye at this? We are not the doer of these things, but it is Christ who worked them by means of those who believe on him. Believe, therefore, also yourselves, and you shall see that with us there is no trick of words, but faith through love which is wrought in us towards Christ, which if you yourselves should obtain you will no longer seek demonstrative arguments, but will consider faith in Christ sufficient. These are the words of Anthony, and they marveling at this also saluted him and departed confessing the benefit they had received from him.